We have the CEO of Novo Nordisk, Lars Frogard Jorgensen. Lars, it's great to see you in person. Thank you for having me, Katie. Of course. So many people, including myself, have been asking you for months about how you plan to ramp up production to meet the demand that Abigail was just talking about. We finally got an answer uh, last week. Of course, Novo Holdings announcing it will buy Catalent for $16.5 billion, acquiring three of its factories in that process. But already, I mean, you have Eli Lilly calling for regulators to look into this acquisition. How big of a risk is there that you run into antitrust concerns? Well, obviously, when we do a transaction like this, we have given uh, some thoughts to that uh, issue. And it's really important to underline here that we respect all the contracts that's already established with, uh, with other customers. What we are looking at is an opportunity to get, get access to some uh, vacant capacities. Uh, there are options for putting in new lines, etc. So it's really the underutilized part of Catalan that we are, are making a, a play on and uh, we'll honor all the existing contracts tracks that, that's out there. And of course, no holdings acquiring the company. They look forward to uh, enjoy uh, still serving uh, customers in the future as a contract manufacturer. Are you preparing, though, for the possibility that you do run into antitrust questions? I believe it's, it's normal in a process like that uh, to have to answer some questions. So we're ready for that. But again, I'd like to underline that uh, we honor all the contracts that's, that's there. Uh, it's really a play on uh, idle capacity that we can utilize to serve many more patients. And uh, we'll probably get to talk about the demand for our obesity medicines and our diabetes uh, medicines. So there's a huge opportunity to serve more patients, and that's really what we are, we are aiming at. Okay, and I promise we'll move on, but it sounds like you're confident that this deal will close. Yes, otherwise we wouldn't have done it. That makes a lot of sense to me. Okay, so. Proceeding with that premise that, of course, this deal does close, how much will this add in terms of capacity in 2026, do you anticipate? So when you look at us adding capacity, it starts with the active pharmaceutical ingredients. We have uh, finished a new facility in North Carolina. We are building two more in Denmark. And now we're looking at ramping up our fill finish capacity. And uh, the Catalan acquisition plays a part of that puzzle. But we are also going to expand on our existing uh, five strategic sites. So the Catalan uh, acquisition is an opportunity of moving that build a bit earlier, but we still need to do more and we'll be investing also in our existing facilities. And so when it comes to this deal, I mean, there is a question of why do it this way versus building your own. Was that really just a question of urgency here? Yeah, it's a matter of time. And uh, if, you, if you were to build, uh, say, a greenfield site, uh, you have the whole construction, you have to recruit people and you have to train people. In the case of Catalan, we get uh, sites we know, we already have partnerships on those sites, uh, we get trained uh, people and uh, really working with that uh, makes a lot of sense for us in terms of scaling and also getting uh, a time advantage of, of getting to serve many more patients. And to get a little bit technical here, so as I understand it, the Catalan factory, so they're going to add capacity in the final fill finish stage of making Ozempic and Wegovi. What about the active ingredient, though? And I know everyone pronounces this a different way, but semaglutide, how much will you have to spend to scale up production there? We are actually actively spending billions of dollars in ramping up the API capacity. And I mentioned we have already made those decisions, so we're going to significantly enhance our API capacity. And there's a relative long lead time in doing that. That's an even harder ramp than, uh, than fill finish capacity. Mm -hmm. And we started that years back, and we'll have the first factory kicking in in a, in a relative short period of time. And uh, we are also investing in, in our fill finish factories. We announced a huge expansion of a couple of billion dollars in France mm -hmm. last year. So it's really the whole spectrum of capacity from API, fill finish, uh, assembly packaging that we are moving to upgrade. Yeah, like you said, I mean, a lot of moving parts here. I do want to draw a finer point under that. So when it comes to fill finish versus, of course, the active ingredient, I mean, which is the more difficult hurdle to climb? What has been uh, the more challenging part of this process? The most difficult is the API. So that's a proprietary technology you have inside the company, and, and we do that uh, on our own uh, each and every time. The fill finish is a more of a say, standardized uh, technology that many uh, do uh, of a similar uh, matter. And there are uh, fill finish capacities out there you can source. So that's more of a standard technology that you scale. Um, and we do that inside the company and, uh, and with CMOs. And so on the other end of this, 
past 2026, of course, when you have all the Catalan factories incorporated and you work out, of course, scaling up when it comes to the active ingredients, will you be able to produce all the Ozempic and Wegovi that you need to fulfill the U.S. demand that we're seeing? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And uh, <laughs> if I knew exactly what the demand would be, it would be easy to, to answer. Most likely, we'll still see a number of years where demand will be larger than, than what we can supply and, and probably also what competition can supply. So that's a very attractive uh, growth opportunity. And what we do now is that we actually try to take care of patients starting treatment and you know, have a measured number of started doses to make sure that those who start treatment also get a very good and positive journey as a titrate up to high doses and get to the maintenance dose. So uh, we will be scaling capacity significantly, but most likely demand will still be very, very significant. Well, when it comes to demand, of course, one of the factors, of course, is price. So let's talk about that a little bit now, because in your earnings call, Novo did warn of, quote, intensifying competition, the pressure on the price of these drugs for obesity and uh, diabetes. So Wegovi's list price uh, is just under $1,400 a month. As capacity ramps up, do you anticipate that those prices will come down? So what typically happens in the U.S. market is that you, you have a list price and then you give significant rebates uh, to, to the pharmacy benefit managers and you over time enhance that rebate. And that's also what we see for, for, for Wigovi and our other products is actually you know, similar dynamics for all products. So, so I think it's, it's a relative stable competitive environment where we see this uh, you know, erosion, slow erosion of value. And uh, by doing that, you actually get to more and more patients uh, because typically what you add are you know, lower priced uh, segments compared to where you, you start. And it works for us because the volume of opportunity is so significant that with that steady uh, say, price development, you can actually serve more and more patients. And the, the value of the, these uh, type of products in terms of cardiovascular protection, uh, potential benefit on other uh, comorbidities is just very, very significant. So I think it's a good deal also for the healthcare systems. Well, let's talk a little bit about the intensifying competition when it comes to prices. How closely are you watching, for example, the pricing of Eli Lilly's Zepbound? Well, uh, we are uh, established competitors in, in diabetes, so we've been competing for many years. So, so I think it's, uh, for me, there's not a lot of change to, to how we compete. Uh, the primary competitive angle is innovation. So the value of a market is driven by the quality of the innovation that's, that's being done. What is quite significantly different here is that actually that the number of patients that are uh, eligible for treatment is, is much higher than what we are, are serving today. So there's uh, more than 100 million uh, Americans living with a BMI above 30, mm -hmm. and uh, we are serving less than a million today. So, so it's really a fantastic opportunity of helping patients but also, of course, uh, growing our, our business. Yeah, the total addressable market here, of course, is huge. And we're having this conversation in New York. We're talking about the U.S., but of course, you're an international company. So let's talk about international demand as well, because you recently said, actually, that you were surprised that European consumers have been so willing to pay for these drugs out of profit. So just compare and contrast a little bit here. How does European demand look like relative to U.S. demand for these products? So we saw when we launched in the U.S. a very, very strong uh, uptake. Uh, we then launched in a couple of European markets just to see the same uptake. And, and those are markets where uh, there is still no reimbursement, so it's actually out of pocket. Mm. And that, that was my comment that typically in Europe you have not seen a high willingness to pay out of pocket for medicines. But if you live with obesity and you have probably tried all kinds of different interventions that you have also been paying for and most likely not succeeding, so now there are opportunities for actually getting a strong weight loss and uh, the price point is, is one that many are, are willing to pay for out of pocket. So that's a very, very favorable situation. We're still trying to make contracts with healthcare systems because when you look at the socioeconomic aspects of living, living with obesity, some of those who need treatment the most are those who cannot afford paying out of pocket. And we want to make contracts with healthcare systems to make sure that those patients are also served and uh, they are also some of the patients that end up being the biggest cost burden for, for healthcare systems. So it's actually quite meaningful to, to address obesity also in that population. So again, you're in active uh, conversations for those contracts, but looking forward, I mean, do you anticipate still that the U.S. will be the primary, the biggest market for these drugs? 
The US is typically the market where the regulator approve a product the first, so the FDA was first to approve uh, we go and most of our products. It's also the market where you uh, fastest get uh, to the market, uh, you work with the, with the payers and you build formulary access. And uh, it's, a, it's a private healthcare market where there's also a big demand factor from, uh, from the individual uh, having insurance and uh, having good well-paid jobs and good coverage. That's, that dynamic is different in Europe, where it's typically single-payer uh, healthcare systems where reimbursements come slower. Uh, the European Medicines Agency are also slower in, in approving products. So innovation gets going in the US the first, and then uh, the rest of the world follows on. But we have a huge coverage of what we call international operations. So we have a huge reach. So we believe that there's also a very sizable and a very continued uh, strong growth opportunity for us to serve those markets. Well, I'd also like to talk about how this drug is actually taken, because obviously you're focusing on the injectable versions of these drugs. But when it comes to the orals, the pills, uh, you had initially aimed to file the pill in the second half of 2023. That, of course, did not happen. Can you give us any color around the timeline of when you might file again? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, if you do market research and ask a patient what would you prefer, an all or injectable, most say all. Yet we have this category exploding based on weekly injections. So, yeah. so I think also we have to uh, acknowledge that a weekly injection is, is very convenient for, for many patients, but there's also an all segment. And we have made a major breakthrough in actually taking a, a large protein like semaglutide, made it available as a tablet based on some special formulation technologies. Uh, that is already launched in, in diabetes. And now we're looking at different dose strengths and uh, collecting a bit more data to investigate how do we bring that to market in obesity. And uh, it takes more API when mm. it's a tablet. So we also have to, to you know, balance how many patients do we serve and what's the, what's the best way of doing that. So for me, it, it talks to our leadership aspiration of having multiple molecular formats, uh, different treatment uh, regimes, tablets, injectable um, products directed to obesity and or uh, diabetes. So a big portfolio of optionality that we can really bring to patients and drive tremendous health benefits. So it's pretty close on that pronunciation. Semaglutide? Yeah. Semaglutide. Yeah. I'm going to write that down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is, but there, is there any timeline that you could commit to? For example, I look at Eli Lilly. The thinking is that they could have their pill on the market in 26, 27. Is that a similar timeline for you? What's your thinking? We, I think we can match that because we have the, the clinical data. Um, but I, I would also say that uh, there's other uh, interesting data uh, to commit to. So by the end of this year, we'll have uh, clinical phase three data for our next generation products, CACRISEMA. Mm. Uh, we just announced some uh, very exciting phase one data for uh, another uh, molecule, amicretin, uh, in phase one with some all data. So uh, we believe we have a very interesting portfolio that we can successfully uh, bring to market over the coming years and get closer and closer to the different patient preferences that are there and uh, you know, help patients uh, live uh, rich and full lives uh, despite the fact that uh, you're living with obesity.